They even sacrifice their sons and their daughters to the demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. And the land was polluted with the blood. We are not going down there as the heroes. We are going down there in a spirit of repentance. We are guilty. The blood is on our hands. We're 15 years late. There's no heroes here. Do you hear me? So we are going down, Lord Jesus, be merciful to me. Lord, forgive our country. We are more guilty than the police when they take us away because the police are not called to be the salt of the earth. We are. We are. We are. We are. Since the Roe versus Wade decision legalized child killing in 1973, over 25 million children have been brutally murdered. Christians are finally facing the reality that they share in the guilt of this Holocaust and that God is calling them to repent of their apathy and rescue the children. I'll be honest with you, every time I feel like, Lord, I can't stand another ounce of conviction, God gives me another pound and that's what I really need. And every time I'm near an abortuary, the breaking of God goes on in my life because I realize how much my heart still yet needs to be rent. May God rent our hearts. Operation Rescue is people who have responded to a move of God who are saying, I'm responsible to love my neighbor. I'm responsible to rescue the innocent. And it is producing revival in people's hearts. People who get involved in the rescue movement become transformed because it takes their eyes off themselves. It puts their eyes on Christ and on other people's needs. These people have, you know, have finally realized that unless we defend our brothers and sisters in a very definite way, we are really denying God. We're not living up to our faith. We're not doing what He calls us to do and to be. God is saying to His people, the church, those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He is saying one word, repent. Some would say, repent of what? Blood guiltiness. Deuteronomy 21 teaches that for God's people to be absolved of blood guiltiness, they had to be able to pray two things. O oh Lord, our hands have not shed this blood, neither did our eyes see it. Forgive thy people and set not the guilt of innocent blood in our midst. The church in America today cannot pray this because our eyes have seen it. Amidst a flurry of religious activity, the church for the most part has stood idly by while over 4,000 babies a day are being slaughtered. The prophet Isaiah spoke of a people who excelled in religious duty but missed the heart of God and refused to protect the innocent. He said of them, When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. One of the things that has convinced me that this is a move of God is that we have always addressed ourselves. Addressed our own need for repentance, our own need to beg God for mercy. 
Besides the blood guilt incurred by the church, our entire nation is stained with the blood of these children and is increasingly staggering under the weight of God's judgment. The 25 million children that are dead are enough to damn any nation to hell and to ultimate judgment, period. You should get out your concordance and study out the theme of innocent blood. But suffice it to say that the blood that has been shed and now stains the garbage dumps of America, now stains the once land of the free and home of the brave, that blood is crying from the ground to the God of heaven and earth, saying, How long, O oh Lord? How long? The scriptures teach very clearly that if innocent blood is shed and unavenged, the entire nation may perish. For example, Judah was destroyed by invading armies because they were sacrificing their children. The Bible says, So he sent them against Judah to destroy it because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood which he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. Does this mean then that we are without hope? that nothing can be done to stay the wrath of God? If we repent and obey His commands, there is hope. In the same passage quoted earlier, Isaiah goes on to say, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And I ask you to stand in the name of Jesus while there is still time to stand. And perhaps God will see from heaven and he will look down upon us and say, these people have moved my heart. These people have given me a reason to show mercy. And I submit to you that the answer lies with you. We thank you that we're here to please you, Father. We thank you for these babies that will be saved today. We thank you that they will have life nine months from now. Many of them, the mothers who will change their minds, Lord. We thank you for that. But even that, Lord, is not our ultimate reason for being here. We are here to do what's right, Father. That's our motivation, to serve you and to please you. We're not some select group out on the fringe of society that's lobbying for special interests so people can make money. And I think the media and the police and everybody needs to recognize that we're the people that live next door to you. We're not people that uh, do not go to work every day, do not take care of their children, do not pay their bills. We're those people, and we're the people that are con concerned about babies that are being destroyed in mothers' wombs, and they're not even given a chance. Over the years, actually 15 years now, I have done everything I know to do to express this conviction that an innocent human life has a right to live. I've participated in March for Life's petitions, written to congressmen. I've spoken publicly in seminars and conferences. I've written articles, supported crisis pregnancy centers. I've done everything I know to do, even adopting a little abandoned child from another nation. But I sensed in my spirit recently that something of a next step was on the horizon for me. And as I heard of Operation Rescue and the opportunity to prayerfully and peacefully and physically place myself between an abortionist and a preborn victim, a child, I felt the time was now for me. And so I gave myself in this way. It was an honor. I was scared, I have to admit, but it was a very fulfilling experience, very rewarding, as I realized I was helping to stem the tide of the, the extinguishing of human life in this land. Sir, I'm Stephen Dentino, the Trudeau Township Police Department, Chester County, Pennsylvania, and advising you that you're in violation of Section 3503B1I of the Crimes Code, which is criminal trespass, by your presence on this property. Therefore, you must leave this area immediately or you will be arrested for criminal trespass. This property is posted by means of signs located at the entrance and stating no trespass. Do you understand what I'm advising you? I will give you 15 seconds to leave and then you will be arrested. Knowing the many scriptural admonitions to obey those in authority, some wonder, is it right for Christians to break the law? What should we do when man's law and God's law conflict? All right, sir, I'm arresting for criminal trespass. Stand up. Can we go by the stretcher? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Ready? 
ever so often, the pastor will call me and say, surely you don't agree with that. I said, I sure do. Oh, but we're breaking the law. I said, have you looked in the New Testament? Simon Peter and the disciples and all the rest, they were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said we ought to obey God rather than men. And they preached anyway. Anyway, and they went to jail for it. Many people today are confused about the matter of the obedience to the laws of our country. In these times when the law permits so many things which are so contrary to God's law. What does the Bible say about this matter of authority and obedience? Basically, it says this. First of all, that all authority comes from God, and that all human authority, secondly, is delegated by God. And thirdly, it teaches that no human authority can countermand the authority of God. And if any man tries to do that, it is our responsibility as Christians to obey God rather than men. This is the kind of disobedience that we read about in the scripture where Daniel disobeyed the command not to pray to any other god except the idol of the king. This is the kind of disobedience that we saw in the three wise men that disobeyed the command of Herod to return and tell him where the baby Jesus was. This is the kind of disobedience that the apostles demonstrated when they refused to cease to preach in the name of Jesus Christ and said, we must obey God rather than men. It's getting arrested too radical. It's obvious it, it can't be too radical in the face of mass murder. And what we're facing is mass murder, a mass murder that has continued for, for 15 years. Uh, our Christian tradition is one that goes very deep in terms of being willing to face uh, those kind of difficulties. Jesus himself was arrested and never survived the arrest at all. Someone asked me a, a question once, um, if abortion is murder, why don't we act like it's murder? And uh, I couldn't answer the question very well with my own experience. I, I couldn't give a good answer why I shouldn't act like it was murder. That question is what gripped me, and I couldn't see any difference in trying to save the life of a child in the womb from someone who was in the front of my church being murdered. You know, the Bible's clear in Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. It says, deliver those who are being taken away to death, and those who are staggering to the slaughter, oh, hold them back. I would say this is normal Christian behavior. It's yeah. not radical. It's simple obedience. When God says, I believe in the Bible literally, when God says, rescue those being dragged away to slaughter, I don't think he's saying, if you have time, if you have a few minutes, by the way, next Saturday, maybe be. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, rescue them, period, categorically. And I do endorse the rescue movement. I think this is, this is the logical conclusion of uh, what it means to call babies human, to call them our brothers and sisters, and to uh, call ourselves a Christian. We refuse to allow babies to be slain by a sharp scalpel. It's absolutely a, a great merit to stand up against the most horrible injustice of all, the injustice of the murder and elimination of poor innocent children. Each one of these police officers is courageous. Each one of these police officers would run out in the middle of the Turnpike or the Delaware River to rescue anyone here. And that's the same thing we're doing. We're using the necessity defense. If a police officer comes to my home and there's a fire in the bedroom, he can break down the door. He can do things which would otherwise be called a crime. They'd otherwise be breaking an entry or burglary. But he can break that door down and rush in to rescue someone life to obey a higher law and that's why we're here today and that's why the policemen should join us if a life will be saved by my arrest it's a very small contribution for such a worthy cause do your job arrest them do your job arrest them a 
uh, we see uh, Jesus going into the temple uh, and making a whip, turning over the, uh, the money changers' uh, tables. Uh, that wasn't exactly in accordance with the law, and I think we need to make some of those same uh, whips, uh, as it were, uh, get out on the street, uh, sit down, protest, and uh, fight the good fight of faith uh, for King Jesus and uh, seek to have uh, uh, dominion in the area of life uh, and stop the, uh, stop the murdering. We're at a place in this movement where we need some people in jail for a day or two. The reason being again, as St. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, do not be discouraged, my brethren, about my imprisonment because it's caused the furtherance of the gospel. Because many of the brethren, seeing my bonds, have waxed bold in the cause of Christ. You are as safe in jail as you are in the protective hands of God any place else. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's a will to do what's right in spite of your fears. You know, it's uh, reminiscent for me of Nazi Germany. They forced the townspeople to come through those extermination camps and see the dead bodies uh, implying that there was some responsibility on the townspeople to oppose the law and to uh, to speak on behalf of those innocent people who are being killed. You are saying now that uh, children are being killed and uh, this is a law that we should break, but break it peacefully. It is uh, interesting and a little bit discouraging to me that the Christian community is struggling over this issue, whether it's right or wrong. Two days ago, on October 4th, 1988, I was arrested here in Atlanta for taking part in a rescue, for sitting in front of a clinic door to put myself between the women who were coming to get abortions and the medical staff inside who was waiting to kill their babies. Of course, children aren't the only victims in this Holocaust. Mothers are the second victims. They have been lied to and exploited in their hour of crisis. And I was a victim of abortion as a teenager, and I did not know the devastation and the heartache and the guilt that goes along with it. And I'd just like to warn others about that, that you don't know what you're about to get into. You're about to murder a helpless child. Well, I want to tell you there's a lot more going on for the women who've been through it. I went through eight years of pure hell because of it. It's not right, and I'm telling you, they never showed me, never told me one time what was inside of me. They never showed me pictures like you wonderful people are showing these women. They lie. They just totally lie. They tell you it's a simple procedure. It'll be over in 15 minutes. You'll be a little nauseous when it's all over. That's not all there is to it. There's a baby inside of these women. There were two inside of me, and they'll never be. And I may never be able to have another child because of that. But they don't tell you that. we got to help the woman. we got to bring the children to birth and let adoption take place. I heard tonight that a young girl changed her mind and has chosen to give her baby life. That's it. That's what it's all about. While the rescue movement's primary objectives are to save children and mothers from the nightmare of abortion and to call the church and the nation to repentance, another benefit is its impact on the political arena. Operation Rescue, after 15 years of efforts to judicially and legislatively correct the problem, Operation Rescue is a new and a fresh breath of air. Politicians don't respond to logic. Politicians never see the light until they feel the heat. It's just the nature of the average politician. They don't see the light till they feel the heat. And that is exactly what Operation Rescue is doing. We're not extremists. We're following the nonviolent ethic of Dr. Martin Luther King. And if we're extremists, then Dr. King was an extremist. And we're hypocrites to have a national holiday after his name.
Over the period of the last 15 years, there's been somewhere in the vicinity of 25 million unborn babies who have been killed. Uh, all of these are, are human beings, they're human persons who have been created by God for, uh, for a life here that he intended to be pur purposeful and to contribute to all the rest of us. I don't see any clear signs of a turnaround with regard to that situation. We're still losing a million and a quarter to a million and a half a year. And it seems to me that there has to be some kind of action that will both draw attention to the importance of this issue and possibly get some of our people to realize how important it is to, to change it. We're here to show our strength to go for the kind of legislation that we need to save all of the innocent preborn children. I was pleased to speak about the Paramount Human Life Amendment, which will put in the Constitution of the United States simply that each human being has a paramount right to life vested at fertilization. And therefore, with these words in our Constitution to show that there is no exception whatsoever, each born and preborn human being will be protected. And it is easy for this city and this nation to say, wait. And they do not show on their televisions the mutilated bodies of our children. And today we are not waiting any longer because the laws which allow our children to be mutilated and killed in their mother's wombs are strictly unjust laws. Wisdom calls aloud in the streets. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets she cries out, gateways of the city, she makes her speech. We bend to the halls of Congress. We bend to the stairs of the Supreme Court. We bend to the office of our senators. We've written thousands of letters. It's time now to go to the streets of America. One reason the rescue movement has grown so quickly is because of the involvement and leadership of the clergy. If God's blessing is to continue and the movement grow, the participation of ministers must continue and increase. It's worth getting involved in, it's worth fighting for, it's worth uh, dying for, and I think that's what it's going to take uh, to uh, turn this issue about and indeed uh, glorify the Lord in so doing. I, I've really felt my Christian faith, my priesthood really alive in, in this incredible marketplace in defending and trying to protect the lives of these unborn babies and to save them, mothers, from their own victimization. But I would just urge pastors to consider rescues before God. Consider leading your people as God has called you to be a leader to shepherd your flock, they will follow you. Consider this before the Lord. If this is right before God, you need to lead. You need to lead your people into what is right before God. When the Lord talked about loving our neighbor as ourselves, he, he set it up in the framework of saving someone from death. Remember, the priest and the Levite walked by while the man was dying in the ditch, but the Good Samaritan saved his life. So maybe the priest thought he was not called to a ditch ministry. Maybe he was uh, saying, well, I'm called to preach the gospel. But the Lord said, he's not the one, in so many words, said that he's not the one who loved his neighbor as himself. It was the Good Samaritan who saved the man's life. Romans 5.20 teaches us that where there is no law, there's no transgression. And today we're preaching the gospel to people and it's having no effect on them. There's no repentance because there's no law. And when there's no law, there's no sin. And there can never be a law and there can never be sin when we as a nation murder four or five thousand children every day. If we live in a nation, in a world that allows that type of a holocaust to go on and they are not guilty for that, how can they be convicted of the nature of sin that's within them? The Great Commission, which is the gospel, is to take the, the message of Jesus Christ into all the worlds and disciple the nations. That's the second part of it, not just preaching salvation, but then taking that message and discipling the nations. And we have not discipled America. This is why we have abortion on the men and many other social ills. And God has said that we're the light of the world, we're the salt of the earth. And if we weren't doing our job, abortion wouldn't have been here. 
We are to follow Jesus. We are to be his standard in the world. Priests, ministers, especially, you know, those who have leadership in the church, they are to become like Jesus. And unless they lead, how did Jesus get the apostles to follow him? Because he did what the Father wanted. We're going to get people to follow Jesus because we are doing the same thing. So this is what he wants. This is what we have to do. And if we're not doing it, we're not being faithful to our brothers and sisters. That if you look at the Bible, what you see there is that God's people are only as good as their leaders. If we are mediocre people who want to live in the comfort zone and have a comfortable Christianity, then we will have churches that reflect that. God is calling us to move out, to stand for Him in the marketplace, and to put our bodies on the line in this issue. I didn't know what the community would think, but I knew this. I can only obey God. A clear trumpet is being sounded. Will the church and other pro-life Americans repent and rise up and make the sacrifices necessary to save the children, the mothers, and the very future of our nation? That is what we need in this hour. The leaders leading, the people volunteering, the hosts of God fighting with us, all springing from a platform of repentance. And we could see this child holocaust ground to a halt. We could see our country restored. And we could see revival and reformation in this country, such as some people perhaps dream, couldn't even dream of happening. I think a lot of people who argue against rescue um, are, are, are so adamant in their arguments it's because deep down inside, they know if they have to admit that it is right and, and not only legitimate to do, but compelling to do, then they themselves will have to do it. And they are afraid to do it. The message of Operation Rescue is join us and the killing will stop. But more children were dying every day and what we were doing was not enough. And I heard about the rescue missions and I joined them. We are saving children. We have, I've held in my arms a child whose life is saved because I risk arrest. So I know that this work is very successful. There is no way in this earth as it is now that I will not support Operation Rescue, that I will not put my body with Operation Rescue between the murderers and those poor defenseless little babies, the unborn. We give thanks for the gift of life they enjoy, to reaffirm their commitment to the dignity of every human being and the sanctity of every human life. We are the people that have been born into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. That we can as Christians come out of our shells, come out of our fears, come out of our prejudices, come out of our religiosity and step into the purposes of God. We have been born for this day. This is Middle America. This is the church. We are forcing the gate open. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Amen! Hallelujah! Holy Lord God! Hallelujah! But I'm asking God and I'm believing God that He is doing something in this hour that no one could have foreseen, that if you had looked a year ago or two years ago, you'd have said, well, it doesn't look like anything is going to happen. We just keep plummeting down this path of cruelty and injustice. But God has a way of erupting on the scene through His people in a way that no one could predict as they respond to His voice to repent and to obey Him and to defend the innocent and to rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death.